Hello there. Charles R. Sable back with you. Um, doing something a little different today um, than I've been doing recently. Um, I'm going to bring you a message that um, I had uh, prepared in my one of my final classes in seminary. Um, it was a uh, oral presentation class, actually. And um, it was preparing people to go out and be pastors and so forth, which I wasn't going to be, but <clears throat> it was very helpful because I got to do more research <laughs> and um, in an amazing realization of the passage we were supposed to, we were assigned to uh, uh, teach on or preach on. So I wanted to share it with you here. I, I, many of you have probably already, or some of you have probably already seen the recent video that I uploaded earlier this morning or this afternoon um, on uh, a, a message actually preached today by uh, uh, an associate pastor uh, named Reese Whitehead. And or was it Whitehead or Whitefield? Can't remember. Let me make sure. It was Reese Whitehead. Yes. And I have a bad memory. Sorry, guys. I mean, I reviewed this right before talking to you and I still forgot. Um, anyway, I want to because that seeing that video it really 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 touched me uh, emotionally and i felt well maybe i need to go back to the basics and teach um from the new testament something very important and i thought of this message which i've never taught and so i'm going to teach it to you today um so if you want grab your bibles um turn to the, the book of philippians um, we're going to be going over chapter 1, verses 12 through 18, okay? Very important to know about this because it prepares a Christian in their evangelism under extreme persecution, which we are facing in this current day. And so this is going to be helpful as well as what Reese Whitehead had to say. It, blessed to, it just blessed me so much, and I hopefully you watch that video um, and share it. I mean, this, that, that video there needs to go viral for the church. Anyway, so I'm going to go, go over this with you, um, and I'm going to kind of go over from reading this presentation, but I'll be adding my two cents as I go. I'll try not to uh, take too long. So I'm going to start reading, and then hopefully you get the message that I found, because it blessed me by doing this, because I ended up seeing the message uh, more clearly. Um, so I'm going to start right here. Um, as if I'm standing in front of a, a, a congregation. Uh, good morning, sitting here, standing here today. I understand that there are two categories of people. There are those that trust in Christ and those who do not. The message that I have today, both divisions of people will benefit from. I will read the passage in Philippians chapter 1, verses 12 through 18. Then I will present present in a way that it makes sense to all of you. So here we go. Now I, I I've got it here, but I also have it here, um, which is the New King James. Um, <clears throat> I'm trying to get rather than doing the King James, going to New King James. They haven't changed doctrine. They just have gotten rid of the these and thous, which I appreciate. So I'm going to read the, these passages. Um, verses. But I want you to know, brethren, that the things which happened to me have actually turned out for the furtherance of the gospel, so that it has become evident to the whole palace guard and to all the rest that my chains are in Christ, and most of the brethren in the Lord, having become confident by my chains, are more are much more bold to speak the word without fear. And then verse 15, some indeed preach Christ even from envy and strife, and some also from goodwill. The former preach Christ from selfish ambition, not sincerely, supposing to add affliction to my, my chains, his, his chains, Paul's chains. But the, the latter, out of love, knowing that I am appointed to the defense of the gospel, what then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is preached. And in this I rejoice. And yes, 
I will and will rejoice. And then um, I'm going to go ahead with one of my favorite passages in the Bible is uh, coming up here. So I'm going to go ahead and read it. For I know that this will I turn out for my deliverance through your prayer and, and supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, according to my earnest expectation and hope that in nothing I shall be ashamed, but with all boldness as always. So now also Christ will be magnified in my body, whether by my life or by death. For to me, this is my favorite passage in all of the Bible, for to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Okay, so amazing um preaching by Paul. Now let's go back to my paper that I wrote or message or um, presentation. Now I'm going to skip down to need since I just read this here. Um, from what I was just reading to you, the Apostle Paul was writing from a Roman prison, speaking how certain believers were preaching while in envy and strife and even contention against Paul. We later read that he rejoiced over Christ being preached, even though there were those who were speaking against Paul. Why would someone rejoice when there were people persecuting him and speaking against the things which he was preaching? Why was Paul rejoicing? Well, the bridging, this see they're teaching and, and, present, and presenting this. It says, this is obviously something that is more important to Paul than the difference in opinions or backbiting among fellow Christians, right? So the subject is God, obviously, and the modifier faithful. God is faithful to manifest his grace, right? So that would be like if you're doing a presentation, that would be your, your point of the matter. God is faithful to manifest his grace. And then textual idea, though corrupted humans are preaching Christ in different means and words, God is faithful to manifest his grace, right? So we move down. Even though you do not feel that you know how to preach Christ, God is still faithful to manifest his gospel if you do make an attempt, okay? If you make an attempt, you're planting the seed, God will manifest, okay? All right, here's a question. <clears throat> How can a Christian have faith that God will turn their jumbled mess of the gospel into a manifestation of his truth? Okay, that's a pretty good question. I sometimes question myself. Let's take a look at some basic truths about God. All right, so here it is. Um, Division one statement. God is faithful to manifest his grace through the preaching of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Right? Most Christian most Christians, all Christians, will agree to this, right? An explanation, God is faithful to manifest his grace through the preaching of the gospel of Jesus Christ. God utilizes the words spoken by men to convey his gospel for salvation. Though men are not perfect, his Holy Spirit is. He opens the hearts of the hearers by the hearing of, the, of his words spoken by imperfect mouths and hearts, right? Isn't that cool? It's so true. In illustration, if God desires for his kingdom to come, yet he cannot drive men and women to preach his gospel, his kingdom wouldn't have no, no one in it, right? That, and I hopefully you all agree to that. He, he's depending on our mouths to preach the gospel. Argumentation. Job 23.13 says, But he is unique, and who can turn him, and what his soul desires that he does? Job 42.2, I know that you can do all things, and that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. So, no matter what, God's words being taught, being preached, even though it's a bit off, even though it's through strife and uh, attack, on someone else, it's still being preached. If God, okay, application, if God's plan cannot be thwarted, then we can rest assured that his gospel will be preached and his kingdom will come just as he's planned. 
transition. Okay, this is uh, uh, this is a part of our breaking down the the the, um, the teaching as your oral presentation. If you look to Philippians 1, 12 and 13, we will notice that Paul speaks of being in prison. Yet he says that what had happened to him, his arrest, right? He was in Roman prison, had fallen out rather unto furtherance of the gospel. How is that? Well, even though persecution, even though persecution will occur, God will be faithful and find a way for his gospel to be preached, right? So, so the Christians who know that Paul had been erected for the gospel, ar arrested, oops, I think that's a typo, arrested for the gospel, felt compelled to continue what Paul had so diligently started. So here you have the Christians realizing that Paul's in prison. And there's no more gospel preaching. It's up to us now. So they did. If the parents of a child are arrested, will not other family members jump in and care for the child? The responsibilities are assumed by the other family members. So is the furthering of God's kingdom. When Jesus was about to ascend into heaven, he told his disciples to go you into the world and preach the gospel to every creature or every living soul that was quoted in mark 16 15 matthew quoted him saying go you therefore and teach all nations baptizing them in the name of the father and the son and the holy spirit so god has built in the command that was being fulfilled by the church upon the imprisonment of paul the apostle as he indicated in philippians 1 12 and 13 um, i keep talking about philippians 1 12 and 13 so let's go back and review that 12 and 13, right here. But I know, but I want you to know, brethren, that the things which happened to me have actually turned out to the furtherance of the gospel, so that it has become evident to the whole palace guard and to all the rest that my chains are in Christ. So Paul's excited because the people stepped in and started teaching the gospel because Paul couldn't do it. it. It was just an amazing thing that God actually put Paul in prison so that the people, the Christians who had learned from Paul can then carry the baton. It's our turn. Okay, here's an application. I am giving a hint here that it seems that there's a direct responsibility here to all believers in Christ. <clears throat> Transition. Now, the passage that I have been talking about today discloses an interesting twist. Paul indicated that there are those preaching while in love, and there are also those preaching in envy and strife and against him. They were actually teaching against Paul. But they were still teaching Christ, but probably some heretical doctrine along with it, against what Paul was trying to say, but they were still preaching Christ. Right? Because no two saints are exactly alike, some preach with strife and envy, but still Christ is preached to the glory of God the Father. Because God is faithful, he draws others into his grace and mercy. So what's coming out of a man's mouth or a woman's mouth, hopefully women teaching other women, what a, a man or woman's mouth it might be an envy and strife. It might be to make themselves exalted or what have you, or 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 criticizing another pastor or whatever. But they're still preaching Christ. Um, I already said that. Let's see. Explanation: Men with their fallen flesh can have misconceptions and misguided thoughts. Yet, if the gospel is spoken, God will manifest His hearers to understand. Because of this. We should rejoice that God is faithful and will manifest his gospel. All right. God has always used inferior men to overcome insurmountable tasks in order to show his glory. David and Goliath, Gideon against the Midianites, and Daniel in the lion's den. God's power is manifested through our weaknesses. Um, an argumentation here could be 
a Christian must understand that faith in God relies on them totally trusting that he will manifest his truth no matter how small and imperfect we are. God would fail if he relied on us to succeed and to accomplish his kingdom. Though he uses us as his mouthpiece to proclaim his truth, he will not fail to manifest the salvation of his elect. So which, because we are teaching it, the elect will hear. God will manifest. The Holy Spirit will manifest. Therefore, while a Christian walks in the world, their faith has to be that God is, to, is in total control. And his kingdom is continually manifesting towards the final product of eternity. Paul was rejoicing because the gospel was being preached whether envy and strife, or in favor of what Paul was saying. Every way, whether in patience or in truth, God is faithful and will find a, a way to preach Christ in order to manifest his grace and mercy. So, since Paul's faith in God was strong, he knew that God was in control and Christ was being preached as a result of the work of God. Therefore, he rejoiced. Even in prison, he's hearing of people preaching in strife and, 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 and against, preaching against Paul. They were still preaching Christ. If you imagine being in prison when you were actually assigned to, by Christ to be an apostle, to the, apostle to, the, to the Gentiles, your mission was to start churches among the Gentiles. Now that you are in prison, you cannot continue with the fulfillment of your assignment. How much would you rejoice? When, when, you, when you heard of the manifestation, manifestation of what God was doing among the Gentiles because you had been put in prison, I am sure that Paul's rejoicing was absolutely overjoyed and even jumping for joy. God made a choice to say, okay, you've done your job, Paul. You've ran the race. You sit here in prison and let them carry the baton. They're prepared, they, you've prepared them well. And basically, that's what happened. God moved Paul out of the way so that the church could, could, could feel um, obligated or uh, motivated to get out there and do it. Because who else is going to do it now? It's up to us now. Um, in Acts 2, we can read Peter presenting spirit-filled words of the gospel just weeks after he had fallen from the Lord by denying him three times. After Jesus had resurrected and restored Peter in John 21, Peter became a leader. With the coming of the Holy Spirit in Acts 2, Peter was filled with the Holy Spirit and preached powerfully so that 3,000 believed after he preached. So God's power manifested through Peter. If we look ahead to Acts 10, Peter was not thinking that he should have to go to the Gentiles' home to preach to Cornelius. The Holy Spirit led him to go to Cornelius' Cornelius's messengers with Cornelius' messengers, I'm sorry. When Peter got there, the Holy Spirit led him to start explaining the gospel. Amazingly, even before Peter could finish, Cornelius and his family were speaking in tongues and full of the Holy Spirit. Even though Peter did not understand that he was to preach to Cornelius, the Holy Spirit led him to, and God's power manifested before him. He didn't finish, but they, they, <laughs> the Holy Spirit filled them and they preached and they, they, they spoke in tongues they were filled with the spirit that's an example of what the, this message is about a christian should understand that if they fulfill their role given to them by god to proclaim christ god will do the rest he will be faithful and manifest the preaching of christ and advance his eternal kingdom Philippians 1, 12 through 18 should then be concluded that because God is faithful, Christ will be preached and his kingdom will come. Because God is um, uh, omnipotent, um, omnipresent, and omniscient, he will manifest the gospel through his church of believers in spite of their imperfections. It is not God that, that has these imperfections, but the, his device that he uses for speaking his truth. We have imperfections. So he knows that. So all he needs is for us to go make the attempt. God's involvement in his church in the presentation of his message of salvation is perfect. It demonstrates his power utilizing the most weak and inferior device, us, to communicate his message. That is fallen men and women. 
application is men and women are to be in obedience to what has been commanded and utilize the faith and trust in who God is in order to fulfill his eternal will. How is it the gospel absolutely has to be preached? Well, imagine you were go to go to a work meeting in a city of 100 miles away from you. Your intent is to get there on time and fulfill your time there for the very important work meeting. You cannot get there if you do not know the way. You need to somehow learn directions and how to get there. Once you have heard or studied the directions to get there, you can then successfully get to the meeting. People want to go to heaven. They have never been there. And so they need to somehow find the direction on how to get there. God has provided the only possible direction or way to get there. The gospel of Jesus Christ is the way to heaven. God's representatives are the roadmap to show the way to heaven. God will open his roadmap to those that want to see it. Even if the roadmap is torn, ripped, or crumpled from corruption, speaking the gospel is essentially God's word to the roadway is God's words is his roadway to heaven. All right? Does that kind of make sense? Because a believer knows the gospel, they have become God's voice to present non-believing directions to the way to heaven. Jesus even told us that he is the way, the truth, and the life. Um, to eternal life in John 14, 6. Even though a man is corrupted inside their fallen flesh, God's omnipotent power will open up the road map and manifest his gospel to be preached. Therefore, though you are corrupted in your flesh, speak the gospel in the way that you know and let God's power, God's work through you, let God's power work through you as he always has done through others. Right? So, action, go all of you, therefore, and preach Christ, and God's eternal kingdom will manifest. Amen. And that's basically it. That's why when you, I go back to, um, I, I continued to tell you, what, after Paul preached that, that even though those were, there were two different people preaching in strife and hatred towards Paul, were still preaching Christ. Paul rejoiced. Because he knew God's, he knew God's power. He knew God's will, and God would manifest. So Paul, in his rejoicing, he says, "For for he, he, remember what he said, right here. He said, for I know that this will turn out for my deliverance through your prayer and the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, according to my earnest expectation and hope that in nothing I shall be ashamed." but with all boldness, as always. So now also Christ be, will be mag magnified in my body, whether by life or death. For to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. Well, if you read the rest of, of Philippians, he starts speaking about, go therefore, and don't worry about dying. Don't worry about dying. Don't worry about persecution. Preach Christ, and God will manifest to those who he wills. And so that's the message I wanted to bring you to today. I hope and pray that this will manifest, that you will uh, make the attempt, even though you feel like you're terrible at it. Even if you feel like you might be wrong in some things, preach Christ. Preach Christ. Like, give God the mouthpiece that he, he, is, he is. He commanded you to be his mouthpiece. So be his mouthpiece through persecution and strife to live as Christ and to die as gain. You preach Christ and you die for it. What are your rewards? You go to heaven. You're with Christ. You're rewarded for preaching Christ. Isn't that what we desire to be favored by God? God will favor you if you preach Christ unto death. So therefore go and preach the gospel to every living soul, creature, mankind. Amen. Thank you for joining me today. I pray that this has touched your hearts. And please watch that video by uh, Reese Whitehead. So powerful. Brought tears to my eyes today.
It touched me. That's why I'm doing this today, because of him. Because the Lord touched me with that. So God bless you. And Maranatha, I'll see you in heaven.